Today we're talking about something that has a lot of nostalgia for a lot of you. For some of you, you went there on field trips. For others, you got into trouble at the Laser Light Show. Today, we're talking about the history of the McLaughlin Planetarium. Toronto's McLaughlin Planetarium holds a special place in the hearts of many Ontarians. For lovers of architecture, the Alward and Gwynlock design structure is both iconic and of a quickly disappearing pool. For many, the building houses memories of school trips and learning. To some, it reminds them of a smoke-filled haze, munchies, and Pink Floyd. To others, a children's museum. The McLaughlin Planetarium opened at 100 Queen's Park on October 26, 1968, just south of Bloor and the Royal Ontario Museum. The planetarium would officially close shop on November 5, 1995, after provincial cuts by Premier Mike Harris. Over its 27 years as a planetarium, it attracted well over 6 million visitors and inspired countless lovers of science. Planning for a planetarium in Toronto can be traced back to the 1940s, pushed for largely by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the RASC, with serious efforts not truly starting till the 1960s. Fun fact, the RASC's first planned observatory came remarkably close to being built on the northeast corner of present-day Trinity Bellwoods Park as a collaboration with Trinity College, seen on this 1903 Frederick Todd map of the park, right here. Now, the 1960s saw the United States and Soviets ebbing and flowing across the sky. The entire world was fixated on what was above. With this enthusiasm, Canada throughout the 1960s built planetariums across the country. As Toronto writer Robert Moffat puts it, architects Alward and Gwynlock composed the McLaughlin Planetarium with geometric simplicity and classical symmetry, a cylindrical center structure set upon a raised podium ringed by a octagonal midsection and capped by a hemispherical dome. The building itself was bankrolled with a generous donation of $2 million and a $1.15 million endowment by Canadian Colonel Samuel McLaughlin. Samuel, born in 1871 near Bowmanville, Ontario, was the son of Robert McLaughlin, the owner of one of the British Empire's largest horse carriage companies. Samuel would go on to start McLaughlin Buick and later become the president of General Motors of Canada. The funding by McLaughlin would make the long-standing dreams of the RASC, the ROM, and U of T come true. The ROM would control the planetarium while U of T would donate the land. The building, just south of the ROM along Queen's Park, would be built by Toronto's acclaimed firm, Alward & Gwynlock. The firm was responsible for designing such Toronto buildings as the original CNE Hockey Hall of Fame building, Sunnybrook Hospital, and many others. Sadly, many of them are now gone. Now, the original plans included a large movie theater, a giant parking garage, and direct access to TTC's subway station, Museum Station. The planetarium was a huge success. Space was cool, and attendance was in the millions. The building itself was four floors. A basement with lecture halls and RASC storage. A ground floor with gift shop, coat check, and a Samuel McLaughlin statue. A second floor with Astro Center of exhibits. And a third floor composed of the Theater of Stars, originally with 85 slide and video projectors. Two back rooms housing cooling systems, computers, and visual controllers, 340 seats, and 25,000 watt sound system. And of course, the projector. A 13 foot long universal projection planetarium type 23 6, made by Combinat VEB Carl Zeiss in East Germany. A rarity of the time to be sold technology from behind the Iron Curtain. Now, when the building opened in the late 1960s, the technology was cutting edge. But, as with other technology, it became fairly dated relatively quickly. The ROM would go through substantial renovations and additions in the late 1970s. This would do twofold for the planetarium. One, have some of the building demolished on the north side. And two, significantly diminish attendance during the few years of renovation. In the 1980s and 1990s, the planetarium would branch out. The Apollo program was finished and times had changed. This brought in a phase seen also across the continent. Laser light shows involving music at nighttime 
Young adults would flock to the McLaughlin Planetarium to see and hear Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, Zeppelin, Bowie, and later on, Nirvana and others. The closure of the planetarium in 1995 was abrupt and sad. The newly elected Mike Harris government had just defeated Bob Ray and wanted to symbolically gut the budget of the ROM. The planetarium, despite being profitable and with strong attendance, was kaput. Since the building closed down in 1995, many different propositions were made as to what to do with the building. It was a children's museum for a while, and for the last while, it's just been a storage space and offices for the ROM. Sadly, it now appears as though it's about to be demolished. In 2009, the ROM would sell the planetarium and property to the University of Toronto for $22 million. Since then, the university has pushed numerous plans for the space. Offers were, apparently, made to the music and history departments to see if the building could be of use. Public outcry has been largely ignored by the school, with petitions receiving thousands of signatures, as well as efforts and awareness being drawn to the heritage of the space by the likes of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, Toronto chapter, as well as internally through the U of T architecture department. At present, it appears U of T will be constructing a nine level structure wrapped in glass, metal, and brick, designed by the prestigious Diller Scofidio and Renfrew firm, a building argued to be of practical use to the school and something the architectural community can be excited about. Regardless of people's opinions, this beautiful structure that sits close to the hearts of many Torontonians has sat unused for far too long. What we can say, though, is that this space, and space in general, is still pretty darn cool. As always, if you are wanting to help save Toronto heritage, there are many ways to go about doing so. Consider becoming a member of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario or Heritage Toronto today.